everybody. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you, Tena, for action. And you are here with us tonight. Um, before the official introduction, I would like first to, to say that I'm really, really happy uh, that we have Tena tonight with us in this uh, seminar series. Um, I know Tena for, for some years. I had the honor to work with her and her research group for uh, three years in Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, uh, I, I, we share a really nice field work together, uh, good, really interesting scientific talks, and thank you very much. And uh, I remember a night for a good, for, uh, with good Greek wine in Aarhus that will, uh, I will not forget. So the official introduction now. So Dr. Tenar is a professor at the Department of Biology, uh, Aquatic Biology at the, the Aarhus University. She's a freshwater ecologist specialized in macrophyte ecology and stream ecosystem functioning. Her research group focuses on how natural conditions and human impact regulate macrophyte and biofuel communities in uh, streams and how these communities regulate ecosystem functioning such as primary production, nutrient and carbon cycling. The group works primarily in agricultural streams and Arctic streams, specifically in Arctic streams the group studies the effect of a changing cryosphere on nutrient and carbon cycling. More specifically, it measures nutrient uptake, primary production, and organic matter decomposition in relation to climate change induced alterations in hydrological regimes, water resources, and higher temperatures. Tonight, uh, Tena will talk about how landscape properties in stream catchments influence stream nutrient availability in Arctic areas and how this will affect the in-stream biology and the export of nutrient to downstream coastal areas, which may have substantial consequences for marine prim primary production and trophic relationships. So Tena, the floor is yours. Thank you again for accepting the, the invitation. Well, thank you very much for inviting me in the first place. So I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. Uh, although I would be even more thrilled to be in Kubon, but um, that was not possible this time, but I hope that I get the chance to visit you uh, soon. But for now, um, we'll do it this way. And thanks for the introduction and the presentation. And, um, and so, yeah, you already... Um, told people what uh, what my talk is about so that's fine and i just want to say before i start out that a lot of people was involved in this and uh, you can see some of the co-authors uh, below here so um we all know that now i have to do the right thing here right that so uh okay so uh Jonas, uh the <laughs> Uh, does that mean that uh, all the, what do you say, the uh, animations are not working? Uh, Ten, unfortunately, yes. Yes, apologies. Okay. Because, because it was a, a very large file, I had to convert it to PDF, so my apologies. Oi, oi, oi. Okay, so that's going to change a bit, uh, but that's fine. So we'll do it without any animations, and uh, can you see my uh, cursor here? Can you see my pointer? Or no? Hey. Do you see it, Skivi? Do you see? No, my, um, my no, no, I cannot see. No, you can't see but it. You, uh, there is I? a pointer. You, there is a pointer at the top left part of the screen. You can yep. see a, after the hand. Okay, yeah. Do you yes. see it now? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank Great. you. Okay, I'll do it with that then. Okay, so, um. So we all know that the temperature is increasing in Arctic at an alarming pace. So what you see here is, um, is the increase in temperature during the past, uh, well, now I actually can't see the scale because it's very small here on my screen, but I'll just do like, um, sorry for this, I'm trying to make it bigger, but I can't. Okay. We can see it, don't worry. Tena, we can see it fine. <laughs> Good, good. Uh, so there's an increase, a uh, large increase in temperature, as you can see. And and what is also very interesting here is that we see that the Arctic uh, temperature increase is six times higher uh, during the past 50 years than uh, the global mean increase in temperature. So, and at the same time, 
because of this large increase of temperature in the atmosphere, it also holds more water. And that's resulting in a large increase in precipitation in the Arctic area as well. So that's what this black uh, dot is, or line is showing you. And uh, so with these uh, increase in temperature, increase precipitation, uh, it will also change the snow cover regimes in the Arctic. Uh, and all these things together will uh, increase, net increase uh, the runoff from land to sea. So more water running uh, in the Arctic area from land uh, to sea. And also we see large cryospheric disturbances such as uh, we see that the permafrost is, is thawing. So the permafrost is uh, lying, let's say between 50 centimeters and one meter down in the soil in many areas of, of, uh, of the Arctic. That is thawing now making uh, thermocast erosions occurring, which is uh, large landscape disturbances that we see in the area. And with these changes, we also see that there is, with the increased in vegetation, more precipitation in many places, we also see the vegetation cover is changing and the vegetation cover is increasing. Uh, and with higher temperature, also the productivity of the terrestrial uh, vegetation is increasing in many places, called the Arctic greening, as you may have heard uh, in other, uh, uh, other places. But that's what we call the greening of the landscape. So um, that is occurring. Uh, and all these things have been have shown, um, has been documented uh, across the Arctic. Here you can see uh, how the increase, this is the Arctic, you can maybe recognize Greenland here, looking from uh, the Earth from the North Pole and out, so here's Greenland, and you see from um, changing um, how, how the greening is becoming, or the vegetation in the terrestrial is becoming more green over time, between these two time periods, and also we see that um, this increased thermocast erosion is occurring. Here you see again uh, the Arctic and all the reds are where you see high uh, thermocast erosion uh, risks uh, now. Um, and that has increased substantially over the, over the last 50 years as well. So that um, erosion can happen, happen uh, that happens sort of um, sometimes during the events of um, of uh, of during the summer events, uh, and it can happen abruptly uh, when the frozen soil sort of slides uh, in in the mud uh, when the when the permafrost is um, thawing. So uh, the changes to the landscape due to the increased precipitation and rising temperature is uh, causing um, this erosion, permafrost and greening, and that together is altering the runoff. And what is impo important here is the runoff of solutes such as inorganic carbon, uh, like uh, ammonium, no, inorganic uh, nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate, but also the dissolved organic nitrogen. So uh, these are the solutes of, of uh, of nitrogen, and we also have uh, a changed runoff of uh, organic carbon, either as particulate or as dissolved organic carbon. And um, of particular interest among all these solutes um, is the is these nitrogen uh, solutes because. Um, as you will know or may know, nitrogen is an essential component of, of life. It's uh, used in, um, um, it's, it's often um, available only in, uh, in low amounts in these reactive forms. And uh, therefore it's often the limiting nutrient uh, in ecosystems. 
And that is also the case for the um, primer production or the primer producers in Arctic areas. And um, in this figure over here, you see um, you see a, a sort of a summary of a range of uh, uh, experiments where um, where people have added either nitrogen, phosphorus, or nitrogen and phosphorus to um, to the stream, and uh, then see that could to streams or lakes in this case, and see if there is a, a limitation. And these are the number of sites where there is limitations of uh, of either or both of these um, nutrients. And so what we see is there's often a co-limitation of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, but also nitrogen in itself and phosphorus in itself is um, is often limited. So um, so we see that uh, there is an that the nitrogen um, uh, the nitrogen availability is to a large extent driving um, the the possible or potential. Um, primer production in the ecosystems. And that also means that when we see these alterations in the runoff, um, uh, that means that it also can alter the in-stream, not only the productivity, but also the biological structure. So it might change from only microbial um, primer producers to also uh, filamentous algae or even prophytes in, in, the, in the freshwater systems. And at the same time, it also means that when the runoff, the amount of nitrogen, but also the, uh, the forms of the nitrogen may change um, and the export of those solutes downstream in the systems to rivers, from headwaters to rivers, and even further out to to the sea may change, because this is how, this is how um, how these ecosystems are functioning. You you get the runoff from the landscape to the streams. Transformations will occur. Uptake will occur. Decomposition will occur, and uh, eventually it will end up in the coastal areas where there is also in respect to nitrogen, yes, also a nitrogen limitation. And therefore, uh, whatever happens up here will be reflected in the coastal uh, primer production, maybe, and food web uh, relations. So there are cascading effects of these uh, changes to the landscape due to uh, climate changes. Uh, and any changes in headwaters can can cause changes to um, to the downstream systems. So based on that background, uh, our overall research questions um, uh, is currently two, uh, and one is how may climate induced changes to the terrestrial vegetation alter the nitrogen availability in the Arctic streams? So here, it's about the interaction between the terrestrial um, ecosystems and the aquatic ecosystems. And secondly, how may terrestrial and limnic changes affect uh, the downstream export uh, of the nitrogen to these coastal areas? So both the linkage between terrestrial and streams and between streams and uh, coastal areas is of interest. And um, here I've tried to uh, make, a, make a sketch of a diagram showing our overall hypothesis. So here uh, you see streams from with basically no vegetation in the catchment and to streams with a lot of vegetation, tundra vegetation, no trees though, but tundra vegetation in the catchment. And as vegetation is increasing, we expect that the inorganic nitrogen will be lower because the vegetation 
is taking up the nitrogen for production. At the same time, we expect that the organic carb, uh, nitrogen, sorry, is increasing with more vegetation because the vegetation is leaching uh, the organic carbon and organic nitrogen. And that will end up in the stream. Um, and the and the proportion of these two and the sort of the composition of these two um, nitrogen forms in the stream is important for the food web relations and the and the productivity. So um, we work mainly in uh, in Sagenberg uh, River Basin uh, or in the Sagenberg area up in uh, northeast Greenland where <clears throat> Aarhus University has a, a research or a field station, um, which you see down here, uh, right next to the large uh, Sagenberg River, draining uh, a basin of uh, 482 square kilometers. And uh, it's also a site where there is a, a long-term monitor monitoring um, station for both terrestrial, marine, and freshwater, uh, freshwater um, monitoring. And uh, Aarhus University is doing that together with uh, the Greenland Survey, uh, ASIAC. And so there's a lot of data from this area, and therefore also it's a good uh, place for us uh, to work with, with these questions. And so I'll show you uh, some results from uh, two of these studies. One is uh, specifically on how does the tundra vegetation affect the N availability in the Arctic streams. So that's the relation between the terrestrial vegetation and the streams. And second, I will also show you uh, how the climate change has altered the N export, um, the nitrogen export from um, from the terrestrial uh, off, from the river, Sackenberg River, so down through the river uh, in the past 25 years. So how that water chemistry has changed, which can indicate something about these, um, these uh, changes in terrestrial um, aquatic interactions. And um, so the area is, uh, the headwater streams in the area is very different and uh, you can act, you can almost see it from these different these photos here some are um, draining uh, mountain sites without any vegetation here you have uh, coming from mountain running into the vegetation and here you have a clear water um, more more uh, base flow um, and soil water fed uh, fed stream uh, so there is a large variation in the in the small streams, and there's also a large variation in the vegetation types and cover. And um, you can see it uh, maybe with the change in color here, and also here you see there's a bit there are bare areas and tundra areas um, close to each other. So the whole area is highly variable in both the stream types and vegetation cover and vegetation types. And therefore, it's an ideal place to, uh, to look at these relationships. And we also know that uh, how, uh, what, is, what is driving these changes from the upstream parts and down through these different um, vegetation types of um, dryers uh, Cassiope, which is a heath plant, salix, as you will know, um, but this is the Arctic salix, a very low bush, uh, and then in the grassland down in the valley uh, where we have the wetlands as well. So it's all driven by changes in soil water contents and uh, it uh, changes the soil element stocks and uh, as well as down through the valley or down from the high to the low altitudes, we also see this decrease in active layer depth. Uh, so like the permafrost is, um, is uh, lower and lower as you go down into the valley. So large variation in these, um, these um, important factors. And therefore, we based on that, we chose 
14 headwater catchment in the area. Now on this map below, you, uh, you could see where the station, but the station is around here. And this is the main basin of the large river. And we then chose uh, 14 small uh, streams, um, most of them running into the Sagenberg River, but also some of them were a little bit further away from and running directly into the fjord, with, which is out here. And um, in each of these uh, streams, we were uh, sampling water in three periods during the open water season which is from about 15 of June to 15 of September. So only three months where the water is actually running. The, uh, most of the time it's frozen. And um, then we uh, quantified the vegetation cover in each of these catchments to the streams um, based on uh, remote sensing uh, of uh, using the NDVI, spectral NDVI, which is um yeah a remote sensing that can um quantify the uh, vegetation cover in in an area so we see that our streams are uh, varying uh, uh quite a lot in in ndvi across the 14 streams and um, we also see that the uh, you have the streams uh, from low to high um from low to high uh, NDVI, so vegetation cover. And uh, these are the nitro, this is the inorganic nitrogen uh, together, which is the ammonium plus the nitrate. Um, and you can see that it is also varying quite, uh, quite a lot, although it's generally low and that's what we expect. So you can see it's, uh, almost never over 0.5 milligram in per liter, which is very low compared to if you go to here to Denmark, where a lot of our streams would have two, three, five, six milligram nitro, uh, nitrogen per liter, inorganic nitrogen per liter. Um, and also we see that the DON is changing. There's not as such a clear relationship here with um, vegetation cover and the inorganic nitrogen, as you see it here. Maybe you can maybe uh, see there is an increase with uh, vegetation cover, increase in organic nitrogen. But so, uh, but anyway, these are the, this is the data and the level of, um, level of nitrogens that we find in the streams. Uh, so going back to the hypothesis that we uh, set out to test, uh, when we look at the NDVI here, uh, from uh, across these streams and across the three times that we were sampling, we see that the DON is increasing um, over time. And maybe we put a linear here, but it could maybe even be a saturated curve here uh, with the largest chains in the, uh, at the low NDVI. But the overall pattern is uh, that we see that with higher vegetation, as we expected here, we also see uh, more DON uh, in the water. So organic nitrogen leaching from this uh, terrestrial vegetation is, uh, is what is indicated here. And the second part was that we expected that as there would more vegetation is present in the, in the catchment, more of that inorganic nitrogen would be taken up for productivity in the in the terrestrial and that's also what we see we see it overall for the din for both ammonium nitrate together uh, and it's uh, but also for when we only look at nitrate um, and so that is um, confirming that with more vegetation less DIN is, uh, is present or is available for runoff to the streams. So um, from this, uh, from this uh, spatial study, um, we can conclude that, um, that the stream water nitrogen seems to be related to this terrestrial vegetation development across uh, different 
headwater streams. Uh, and then secondly, we then also we tried uh, to test this, um, our overall hypothesis by also um, uh, looking at this uh, a long-term data set over 25 years. And in, in Arctic, 25 years data set is actually long-term because there's not a lot of data before um, 1990s. Uh, so um, that's what we had. We had water chemistry from uh, this large river from during the past 25 years. And we wanted to see if we could relate the climate change uh, to uh, any changes that we see in the nitrogen export uh, within this period of time. And so uh, our hypothesis here is then, so we can, you can say we, it's still the same um, overall hypothesis that with more vegetation, we'll see these changes to the nitrogen, but instead of across different types of streams, different headwater streams, it's the change over time due to warming. So will the warming uh, maybe um, affect the vegetation? And then um, can we see that, is that reflected in the water chemistry? And so what we did, we looked first. Uh, so the first question we asked is, so do we see that the there is a warming going on uh, in the in the Sagenberg uh, catchment? And here you see the Sagenberg catchment. It's actually it's quite long and it uh, and it starts up in the icy area and it runs through a large lake here. And then it's first and it's measured all the way down here. So um, and a lot of our small headwater streams are running into the valley here. Uh, so maybe just from these two figures here from the, you can see from 97 or from Google Earth from 97 and 2020, uh, from the same, it's just a spot, of course, uh, but you see more snow here as a mean for this summer uh, compared to this summer in 2020. But that, of course, is only two points in time. Uh, so if we look at, we have, what they have been measuring out there, up there during uh, this time since 97 is uh, soil temperature. So we have a soil temperature for each year, water temperature, and also depth of the permafrost. And for all of these, we see that there is an increase. So the soil temperature, which is um, um, half a meter down in the soil, uh, has, uh, has increased, especially here at the beginning of the period. Uh, and also water temperature seems to have um, or is increasing um, and the depth of a permafrost has moved downwards, right? Uh, so there seems to have been um, a, a warming going on in the area um, reflecting here both in water and soil. And here you can see how it looks if you dig a big hole up there uh, in the soil and you hit the a muddy layer, and under that you have the permafrost. Um, and then, uh, then what is the? How is the precipitation and snow? Can we see any changes in the runoff and um, and the sources for the runoff for precipitation? It's really hard to see any patterns, and also for the snow depth, uh, it's a huge variation from year to year, and that is really what is also then reflected in the in the runoff. So there's no uh, clear uh, temporal changes here during this time. But when we then look at um, how the nitrate export, so we here we convert the concentrations in the water to um, a loading. So we uh, take into account if there's a lot of water running or if there's only a little water. And so, because that will affect uh, the, the loading. And we are interested in how much is actually exported out to the fjord. And so when we, when we do this uh, calculation, we see um, that from 97 and up till now, there is a clear decrease in nitrate uh, runoff from land to sea and to out to the coast. It's opposite for the ammonium, though. Um, 
And so here you see it's from 9,000 9, to 3,000. And here uh, also quite high numbers, but it seems that there is an increase of ammonium, um, but also very variable over the years and especially in the later years. But the net effect is that nitrate and ammonium together, there is a net decrease of um, of export to the to the coast over these uh, 25 years. And now this may be a little bit difficult, but here we have plotted each year from 97 and to 2020 and look at the daily uh, Q and load relationship. So that is how much water compared to the loading. And what I really just want you to focus on here is that in the early years, this relationship is really tight. So there is a tight relationship. If there's more water, there's also more loading. So that's sort of everything that comes uh, that is washed out from the terrestrial um, systems are just ending up in the streams. Whereas in the later years, we see a very high variation from this uh, or um, higher variation um, um, around this relationship. Um, and we also see it here where we have plotted the R square of these relationships um, in the early years and then to now. And that relationship is just becoming less tight and um, in these later years, showing much more variation um, between years um, and, and during, uh, um, yeah, in, in these different years. Um, and so that is telling us that there's probably some biology interaction here, much more than there was at the beginning where it was just uh, only a matter of water. But now that it's um, much more um, interacted by or um, affected by some biological uh, transformation, uptake uh, or decomposition and so on. So more biological um, uh, control probably now than it was before. So in conclusion, we see that the, there is a nitrate, there's lower nitrate um, and a more variable ammonium loading. And um, that it seems to be related to the warming over time uh, in this uh, 25 years uh, period. And it does indicate uh, that the vegetation has a larger role or soil microbes has a larger role, but that is also tightly connected to the to the vegetation. So, um, so that's uh, preliminary data. We are trying to also quantify the vegetation in the basin, but um, yeah, it's um, we're working on that. So uh, the take homes here are that um, we see that inorganic nitrogen and and organic nitrogen are clearly linked to the to the vegetation in the catchment, which also means that any changes to the, this vegetation cover in the Arctic landscape uh, will change the, the nitrogen availability in the streams and therefore change the biological structure and functioning in the stream. And from this large, uh, we see that the DIN loads have changed um, and overall it has declined the loads and the export out to the fjord um, and it has become more variable um, over time and it is suggesting that there is an increased effect of vegetation and biology uh, on this stream nitrogen um, due to the warming we see. So um, the outcome is that with this increased terrestrial productivity that we will see, um, and because the whole system, not only the streams, but also the terrestrial and the coastal systems are highly nutrient limited. If we see that there is a decreased export from land to, uh, to sea, 
we will also maybe see a lower productivity in the coastal areas um, in the future than we do now. And also, uh, in the same time, we see an increase of the organic nitrogen uh, transported to the, to the downstream systems. Uh, and therefore, it may change the autotrophic to heterotrophic uh, food webs relationships. And we might see that the, that the systems are changing towards more heterotrophic uh, conditions. And so uh, finally, I'll just want to uh, thank the research station and ASIAC and uh, the Arctic Research Station here, uh, Center here at Aarhus University for the support, as well as the uh, foundations that has um, supported the work and to the field teams that had worked on these, these data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senna. Um, I think uh, we have plenty of time for um, uh, questions. Um, I certainly have a couple, but um, uh, what I would like to do is first to give the, the floor to anyone from the audience who would like to actually ask any questions um, uh, to Professor Rees. Uh, you can ask in English, you can ask in Greek, and I can translate whatever you want. You can uh, type your uh, questions into the chat so that our speaker can see um the uh the question um as you wish feel free to ask in greek or in uh, english thank you um, ten of while well, people are thinking let me let me shoot uh shoot off the first question because uh, i want to pick up um on something you um, you mentioned at the very last slide, uh, I'll go kind of backwards. Um, uh, you, um, you talked about uh, the possibility of um, um, lower cost and productivity simply because you're going to have an increased productivity due to uh, increased terrestrial productivity um, uh, in, the, uh, in the river ion system. Um, has anyone, I know it's, it's of your field, it's not you doing, but has anyone look into that? I mean, the, uh, the effects uh, of uh, what's happening upstream in coastal productivity, just, just a curiosity. So, uh, so if you can actually, if anyone has seen it in the coast, if, if anyone has picked it up, I mean, yeah. you, you actually yeah. uh, so, concentrated so actually, on what's happening in the stream, but yeah. Yeah, so um, actually, we we are because this is also a marine uh, long-term monitoring station. Uh, we are trying now to relate the what we see in the in the coastal areas in the same period for what we see here in in what I showed you, and the preliminary um, results show that the chlorophyll in the marine area has gone down uh, during the same period of time. Um, and at the same time, um, yeah, so that the chlorophyll has gone down, which could show mean that um, that there is less coming out, right? So the less nitrate coming out. So we can't see it in the water chemistry as such, but we can see that the chlorophyll, which is also what you would probably think would be the best um, measurement because that is where if it's so nitrogen limited it will all be sucked up by the by the by the phytoplankton uh, immediately in the coastal areas so we see that that uh, has gone down during the same period so that's sort of um, supporting our our expectation on this downstream export Okay, and are you or anyone in the group is actually looking at um, intertrophic relationships, food webs? I didn't uh, say no, not no. at the moment. No, we well, not not uh, not in this system. Um, we have we have we have collected invertebrates and, but we don't have invertebrates uh, back in time. Um, we can also see now what they are eating now because we can do the isotope 15N and 13C relationships. Um, so we can see 
uh, we could do that across the 14 different streams, which we would actually like to do because uh, that would be nice. What is the bottleneck here is the chironomids, so the 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 larvae, the mosquito larvae. They are tiny, 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 and there are a lot of them. So when we talk about invertebrates in these systems, it's just millions of small chironomids. Um, and therefore, it's sort of, yeah, it's a hard one uh, to sell to people, um, but it is. it would be really great to do it. We have some papers back from 15, 16, where there was a, 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 a British a PhD student who were looking at the invertebrates in some of these streams. And, um, but we didn't really relate it across different uh, catchment types. But that would be great to do. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, any other questions? Capitalia Rotisia, Posas, Greek or English, anything will do. I want to ask the next question as well. <laughs> um, Skevi, any questions from you? Anything you want to add? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, good. Yes, actually, uh, first of all, thank you, Tena. That was really, really, really excite, exciting. Um, well, uh, I have a question. Have you, because I assume that with the increasing, of the greening and the increasing of riparia and area and so on, the alloctonous input will be also higher. And, um, and I am almost sure that uh, a part of this alloctonous material and up in the sea. So have you tested the impact of alloctonous input in the sea? I mean, uh, if they compensate on some, apparently does not, because you saw the decline of, of nitrogen. But mm -hmm. is there any possibility that with the increase of the temperature as well? Yeah, that yeah. is my question. Yeah, I think you're, you're totally right. And um, there must be more alloctonous coming down, although we are talking about tundra and you know, because you've been there, you know that it's it's not a lot of biomass, right? But of course, there would be some of that ending up and some of that would be transported down. And of course, that would be the most recalcitrant carbon. So it will also be because um, in a, in the first place, the, the biomass is or the carbon in this biomass in this type of vegetation is quite you know tough to decompose mm. uh, but um uh, but that also would um would support that more of that would actually reach the sea um but we haven't but you know um we have some data and and you also know uh ada and maria and jonna <laughs> and so they they actually we have uh, so they have tried to connect the stream carbon to what we see out in the fjord they have tried to do it with bacterial comp uh, bacterial um product production and see if they can sort of trace the carbon uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, elements or components com uh, yeah, that can affect these relationships. But, um, but so they're still working on these data. But our idea was exactly as you say, that it would be possible to see, first of all, state the relation, state the links between carbon from upstream and down into the fjord. And then that when we can do that, we can also go further up into the headwaters and see how the carbon uh, is related to the to the vegetation in the terrestrial. Yeah, yeah. Would really that would be great to do more uh, in that. Yeah, to try yeah. to trace it all the way out. Trace. And we also talked about that we could try to do tracer, like real tracer, mm -hmm. like isotope tracing. Isotope. Yeah. But that's because this is a national park, we're actually not allowed to use uh, uh, isotope traces there, but we can ah. do it other places. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you can do it in disco where you were, but um, yeah. but we can't do it here, no. Okay. Um, and about the nitrogen uh, origin, the source of nitrogen, uh, another uh, project, can you say a few things about that? Do you have any results, first of all? from the from the nitrogen sources 
Yeah, yes. so the nitrogen sources in these area is um, nitrogen fixation and nitrogen deposition, basically. And then there might be some geological derived nitrogen. So we have also uh, looked at that and see if there's anything, if there's any um, nitrogen in the rocks that can actually become uh, available for production uh, when it is weathered or erosion and weathering sort of um, can release that nitrogen from the rocks. So we are looking at that. But the first thing we see is that there are some of the rocks up there that uh, has uh, detectable nitrogen. So it could be um, important because it's so nutrient limited. Anything that could be available now and in the future with ice retreating, more land is sort of open, opening up for uh, erosion, more precipitation will increase the weathering rate. And so it could uh, be an important source. But and also with higher temperature, you also see a higher nitrogen fixation rate. So um, and deposition is really low because it is all the way from the populated areas uh, of the world. <laughs> and it's but it is reaching the Arctic, but um, mm -hmm. a small concentration. Okay. But of course, but all it, these sorts may change in the future. Yeah, but uh, so, it's it's important to to mention here that it's not something common to have nitrogen derived from the rocks. I mean, this no, is not, it's common. So it's very important to see if in the Arctic we have some kind of nitrogen in the rocks coming yeah. from the rocks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Yanni? Yeah, there's any questions. So I'll keep on firing. Um, just a, a vegetation related uh, question, uh, Tana. I mean, uh, do you do you see in recent years, um, and by recent years, I'm actually referring to last 20 or 30 years, um, mm -hmm. a, a change in um, um, vegetation physiognomy and structure? I mean, from the pictures, uh, and what you've been saying, it's we're, we're looking into tantra vegetation for sure. But I was just wondering whether you see any any um, indications of, of uh, I don't know, woody shrubs or, or trees invading mm -hmm. or um, things change in vegetation structure. Yeah, uh, we do. And maybe not as much, maybe not in this northeast corner yet uh, as much, but more that the tundra is expanding. But when you go further south uh, in South Greenland uh, or uh, a little bit more south, you see that the bush vegetation is getting more, is also expanding and small trees are, or, you know, like the salix, uh, the willows are becoming higher and the birch um, is getting higher. And so you, you definitely see both that the cover is expanding, but also that the the structure is changing, and uh, and you even see new species coming in. In Nuuk, um, which is the capital of Greenland, um, that's uh, it's not all south, but it's south more south than this uh, than than Sackenberg. and we have seen uh, new water plant species coming in. So there is very few water uh, or macrophytes uh, there in the first place in Greenland. But now we see some new species coming in um, and start to uh, colonize the lakes, uh, which is interesting because, of course, we see just this is the, you know, the southern species, their northern boundary is uh, moving upwards. And that's exactly what we would expect. Uh, as also is occurring in the terrestrial, but it's uh, but even in the lakes you can say because it's still more buffered. The aquatic environment is more buffered for new species in relation to um, to temperature. Um, but we yeah so that is that is that is occurring now. 
Well, ten are new species for uh, not for the area, but for the whole uh, Greenland, from the island. Yeah, so it's another Muriophyllum. So there's used to only be the Muriophyllum altaniflorum, uh, but now we also see uh, a Muriophyllum sibiricum, and so yeah, so that's that's interesting. And so historically, so historically, this is the first time that it is recorded. Well, in this, in in some of these lakes up there, it is, and then further down south in Greenland, uh, it has been seen before. Yeah, I'm, I'm but asking again, you. again, the, you know, the documentation, the observations are very scattered when you start when you go into Greenland, and the, when you want to look back in time, it's really hard to find data on on yeah, yeah sure. back in time. Yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering how uh, a plant uh, ended up in this very uh, well protected area. I mean, can someone yeah. either it was there as a I don't know as a, a seed or someone like bird bring it there. So yeah. it is also important to see the. Um, the, yeah, the, I the, think the I think it must be it must be bird dispersed, right? There's uh, a lot of small ponds all along mm. uh, the landscape around the coast, and um, yeah, they will be just dropping these uh, fragments or uh, in in these environments, and it will mm. just take a little time, and and uh, species will move around and colonize and sustain if 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 the environment. Um, allows mm -hmm. yeah sure just to just to get it right so by by a new species if i understood well um, you still mean native species you, you're not actually referring to any invasive species just... not as such invasive no um it has been we it has been uh, seen in greenland in the 70s in southern greenland so it's not it's just it's moving upwards it's moving yep. north. Yeah. Yep. OK. And, and and something that I would kind of um, uh, expect, um, at least in your river system, that you have um, uh, when you have these changes either in uh, well, in ice and uh, water flow level, this uh, this also means something about uh, changes in the habitat and perhaps um, uh, um, availability for uh, for various other organisms in addition to plants themselves. So um i think that's something that uh, um, you also look at as well uh with the with the secondary producers or yeah no we don't we don't i don't do that uh well well we do it in the group so this year we were doing a biodiversity uh study in yeah. south greenland okay. and we had some old study and there was a guy that they collecting all the invertebrates okay and uh and fish, uh, there's also quite a lot of known about the fish, but the fish is basically just um, uh, Arctic trout. Uh, so um, yeah, so 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 the invertebrate people are also working in in um, especially in the lakes. Yeah, but it is still an area. Greenland is still an area where there's not so much um, done, right? So you know much more from the Arctic. Alaska, because there's a lot of American scientists that has been working there for a long time. Siberia is also there's some areas there where there has been work for a long time. Svalbard as well, um, and Greenland now, but still often Greenland is not. Um, there's a lot unknown there still. Okay, I see. There's a question from the audience. Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your study with us. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is a little bit more generic, but um, on uh, uh, that note, well, uh, what you're talking about right now, um, I would like to ask you, uh, would you say that the impact of global change um, on aquatic ecosystems is more noticeable in the Nordic countries then, because you mentioned uh, Siberia, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Greenland. 
would you say that all these changes are more noticeable up there then? Um, well, that depends on now if you say global change or climate change, because um, if we say climate change, it's really about temperature and precipitation uh, and the uh, and then the effect of those to uh, climate. But if you say global change, I also in that term, I also take the change in land use. And if you take that into account, I think that you will see that the the worst impact impacted streams you will find in the temperate and tropical areas, in the urban areas, in the um, where because of this intimate uh, relate interaction uh, between the terrestrial and the streams um, all over, wherever there are people. Um, um, affecting the terrestrial uh, ecosystems, you'll see it uh, reflected in the streams and the rivers. And the streams and rivers has always been, um, or people have populated areas close to the streams and rivers because of our need for fresh water. So just the whole history and the whole, I mean, there's a lot of other places in the world that has, that are worse off, uh, you can say, if you just look at the stream ecosystem as such um, than the Arctic, because especially if you look at biodiversity effects, right? We know that there's so many um, freshwater species that is um, threatened, disappeared, um, that the nutrient um, loading to streams is immense many places and is um, changing the production and so on. So it's so if you so the impact of global change, if the impact is put um, yeah in relation to uh, how it was before, I think you would say that there would be other places or if you put it into the in relation of if it um, uh, in terms of ecosystem services to human uh, or to the society, um, that's probably bigger other places than it is in the Arctic still. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for example, as I was revisiting streams and lakes in southern Greenland this year, revisited sites that we looked at, uh, we did not, but people looked at uh, 30 years ago, we did not see any change in the, um, basically, no change in the vegetation. There was a little few spe more species, but very little had changed. Uh, if you did the same in an area 30 years back and a place where there has been now populated much more and you put in agricultural or you, uh, you uh, deforested the area, you would probably have seen a much bigger sort of relative effect, if you understand. So it's hard to... Uh, to put into, yeah, so it, it, the global change has affect all places and for the Arctic, what is going on there is is worst for these ecosystems and cannot be brought back maybe, but um, if you would do a gradient of what the effect is, I would think you would see bigger effects other places. Right. Although the temperature is really changing more rapidly in the Arctic than it is many other places. But it's because of the human effect, mostly. The human, the direct human effect on the, in the catchments. All right, thank you. For Difficult question, answer. but good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's any, any other questions, please. <clears throat> No, nothing on the chat line. No, no hands raised. Um, well, if if there's nothing else, um, I can only I don't know, Skev, if you have a final question. Um, if 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 not, then um, I would really like to um, thank Tena very much for her time. Um, 
uh, thanking her for giving us uh, a very different perspective from uh, the perspective we used to uh, in this very sort of um, um, south, uh, well, arid and southeastern corner of the Met. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, you made a comment uh, in the last question, Tana, you, you're probably right with it. I mean, um, we, we kind of complain about um, uh, temperature uh, increases in the southeast med, and um, most of the models and predictions show that um, um, the southeast corner, particularly of the Mediterranean, is going to be uh, kind of hit hard by increasing uh, in, in temperature and decreasing precipitation. Um, and uh, we always tend to forget or listen to um, listen about the Arctic, uh, the Arctic in the news, and we don't have a really um, a good feel of what's happening, just uh, what you read about it, but um, with no kind of a prior experience. And uh, I, I keep on saying that um, uh, we kind of used to the heat and we're pro probably going to be um, uh, heated more in the in the years to come. Uh, but of course, I kind of feel that the impacts, at, at least as far as climate change is concerned, are going to be more profound at your part of the globe uh, rather than in mine. Or should I say that um, I'm more accustomed to heat than you are? Um, so um, I think <laughs> I think today I kind of um, put in one more puzzle, put a piece of my puzzle together as far as the Arctic is concerned. It's an area I don't know. I don't know at all. I've never worked in the Arctic. So thank you. Thank you so much for you know, offering this perspective. And uh, we will uh, definitely like to um, have you with us uh, in person next time uh, and uh, get to uh, do some really interesting work together. So uh, thank you so much, Tana, for your time. Thank you again. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. And thanks for all the for the audience. Uh, thanks to the audience. And thanks, Yonis, and thanks, Skivi, for inviting Thank me. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now in Greek, I thank you all of you for the today's presentation. We will continue from January with the next dialogue of the next seminar. For the moment, I thank you and I wish you a good evening, everyone.